Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to a conversation on the changing environment and transformation of college athletics. Joining me in the conversation is Whit Babcock, Director of Athletics at Virginia Tech. Whit joined Virginia Tech in 2014 and has provided transformative leadership across all the areas of Tech athletics. Prior to Tech, Whit was at Cincinnati, Missouri, West Virginia, Auburn, and James Madison. In fact, he's from Harrisonburg and former student athlete um, lettering four seasons at James Madison in baseball, serving as captain his senior year. I know you're very busy. Thank you so much for joining us in the yeah. conversation. No, it's my pleasure. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, you know, stereotypically, I didn't know it was baseball. I thought it was basketball. <laughs> you probably get that all the time. Yeah, I'm a little taller. I'm 6'5". Uh, <laughs> basketball was my love. I was just a little bit better at baseball, but not great at either one of them. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, you know, so um, as, as you know, uh, over my career at Virginia Tech, uh, th I've had three uh, presidential appointments to the University Athletics Committee over the years. They're four-year terms. And I completed my last one just last yes. spring. My gosh, the last two to three years, the things that are coming up in college athletics. And as you know, some of them, I'm just kind of like, well, hmm, I don't know. And I know I'm kind of old at that. But uh, one of the things I appreciated when you would come to the committee, you could break it down. You helped us understand some of these concepts. And you were also, I appreciated the notion that, okay, these are going to be the challenges. Right. These are going to be the benefits. We're going to have to look at some of this and we may not have figured it out and what have you. So there really does seem to be in a kind of a transition. And so I was certainly appreciative of you coming and helping some, uh, explain some of the major changes. I guess the first one, old hat to you now, but we're beginning to see it's like, oh my gosh, real evidence of it, is that name, image, and likeness. Right. I guess athletes are really university employees now and kind of free agents in a way. Yeah, uh, technically they're not university employees. But oh. Maybe one day um, <laughs> they could be, but uh, what is new and unique now is that, yes, a student athlete can profit off of his or her name, image, and likeness. Um, uh, there's a few ways to look at it. The way I like to look at it or believe in it is if a general student at Virginia Tech can utilize their name, image, and likeness, whether it's music or art or modeling clothes or being a social media influencer, um, student athletes now have that same right, what, which makes it, what makes it a little more difficult is uh, in the highly competitive world of athletics, uh, now that that um, cat is out of the bag, so to speak, there's not much enforcement on what is fair market value, right? If you have an autograph signing um, and somebody were to pay an uh, extreme amount of money, you know, a student athlete can get that. So it's brought in third parties, it's brought in boosters. Um, there is a lot of good at, with it, but when you combine name, image, and likeness with now being able to transfer immediately, it has become, you were right in your term of a free agent system, and I'm not sure that's uh, what college athletics is all about, but hopefully it will normalize a bit. Um, a lot of this was thrust uh, upon us through legal means and lawsuits and things, and this is where we find ourselves. Um, I do enjoy, though, that we will still have legitimate students at Virginia Tech that will put that jersey on and go compete here soon, and that will be refreshing, I hope. But it has been a, a very hectic couple of years with a lot of outside change, yes, sir. Well, and in terms of the, uh, does it have financial uh, implications for the institutions? Um, is it another layer of obligation responsibility? Do you have obligation to try to manage it beyond yeah. the limits? Uh, yeah, I don't know that there are limits yet or that that has been determined. But yes, a student athlete um, must disclose if they're in a business um, arrangement, whatever it may be. Sometimes it's free food, sometimes it's a, a vehicle, whatever it may be. They're certainly taxed on that. That's new to them. So at least on our campus, we're spending uh, a lot more time teaching financial, financial literacy, financial aspects, um, taxes, trying to uh, educate them, right? It's, it's somebody's sons and daughters, so we want them to know the pitfalls, et cetera. And then there's certain product categories that, that are not allowed. Um, but yes, it is a new a uh, bit of a wild, wild west and way different than the collegiate model we grew up on. So uh, would there be some implications in terms of like recruiting? For example, I may love Virginia Tech, but man, the New York market is a lot larger and perhaps I could 
have a little bit more name recognition. Yeah. Is it now part of some sort of calculation for recruiting? It is. It is. Um, I still believe and have seen that young people will typically come to a college uh, based on the relationships with the coaches that recruit them. They have to feel that, that fit and connection. But now, yes, it does come up in um, recruiting visits. What is the name, image, and likeness program like at Virginia Tech? Um, and it, it certainly does come up. Where it comes up more often um, is now that young people can transfer and be eligible immediately. Uh, sometimes a transfer is looking for not only that uh, scholarship and education, but also uh, what might be available to them uh, in the open market otherwise. So it is absolutely a part of recruiting. Um, I think it will be even more important to recruit young people from Virginia, not that they won't transfer, but I think there has to be something that holds you close to Virginia Tech. Um, not that you can't be from out of state and love it, but if you're from Texas, it might be a little easier to uproot and move. So it has certainly changed the game, but we still rely on relationships and people that want to be at Virginia Tech, but it is uh, vastly different, yes. So what if you were non-revenue sport? What if you were uh, Olympic sport? Sure. The, the pie is not going to be potentially as large. Yeah. They, they do have the same options. Um, it is typically not deals that are done at the level of football and basketball, but we are seeing a lot of female student athletes in the social media influencer space, fashion, things such as that. So they have the same option there um, and good for them. They used to not be able to even teach lessons, right? A golfer couldn't go home and charge lessons at his local club for kids to do it. So there is a lot of good to it um, uh, in the Olympic sports, which would, the component that would make it tough is this, if we get to the point in college athletics where there's revenue sharing with the athletes that generate it, you know, the, the television markets, et cetera. Mm. In the past, we've used that revenue to fund the 21 other sports that we have. We have 22. And if there's revenue sharing, um, and maybe that's the right thing, I don't know, but I can see some unintended consequences that it could limit those wonderful Olympic opportunities and student athlete opportunities and, and, and other sports. So I believe in that too, and I'd, I'd certainly hate to see that change. I guess there's also advantages in terms of your division one, division two, I mean, I yep. guess that, and I don't know that that would be creating tension per se, but I guess that's just a reality of yeah. Of, 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 of the marketplace. There, there, there is some tension. You're hitting on a lot of great points. You know, with the NCAA, um, the governing body of, of college athletics, right? They oversee Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, And most of the governance, if not all of the governance, um, when you get to the board of directors, it's presidents um, from all different divisions, et cetera. And, and, and that's been great for a long time. What we're looking for in Division One is a chance to determine our fate. Our rules are a little different. The way we play mm -hmm. is a little different than, say, a Division Two or Division Three school. So it's gotten to be a bit of a bureaucracy. Um, there's been a number of lawsuits, and the NCAs had to change their ways, and um, it's gone all the way up to the Supreme Court. So that's where we found ourselves in this new normal. I'd be curious your opinion. I read in, in, in one um, uh, article that some concerns are coming that perhaps it would benefit men athletes mm -hmm. more than women. Um, I guess that's more sport related, isn't it? I mean, in other words, uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. Do you see that as a potential negative? I, I, if I understand your question, I believe what you're referring to is, is Title IX, right? Equality and equal opportunity for men and women. Um, we are certainly bound by that and want to be, and it's, it's proven to be a great thing for, for, for young women. Um, as long as the opportunity is the same for young ladies um, or Olympic sports in this, uh, either one, to have the same opportunity, uh, you're okay there. What, what we never want to get to based on the finances and other things is if you have to get to cutting sports, and that's something we're very much against. And that's where gender equity, Title IX, would certainly come in, into play. But we don't want to limit those opportunities. The federal government won't let us. But yes, you're wise to look uh, two steps ahead and see what some unintended consequences might be. Yeah. I want to get and discuss a little bit about this uh, portal where students can, yes. can, can, can go into that uh, without, I guess, a penalty per se. I was surprised that 2,000 Division I basketball players Yes. Enter the portal in 2021, and 
15,000 athletes from all right. sports in the first year of the portal. Is it really such that, and I say worst case scenario, but I probably shouldn't put it that way. So let's say that I go to Notre Dame and I graduate from Notre Dame in four years. I got one more year of eligibility. Mm -hmm. And I could go into Portland, and if I'm really good, I could, what, be another team, even a competitor team's quarterback if selected or tied in or what have you? Yes. So that's even theoretically possible. Oh, it's, it, it's absolutely possible, and, and it's happening. You know, in hindsight, things were probably too restrictive when a young person wanted to transfer. You had to sit out a year at the new school and lose a year of eligibility, and that's pretty punitive. And again, if you go back to if a general student on their own initiative, if they want to leave Virginia Tech and go to UVA, they can do that. So th that's where the argument um, lies. What the data shows, though, is if you transfer more than once, typically your academics go down, your GPAs go down. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to hold on to just a one-time transfer option. Um, also, in that instance, you know, I, I, I'm good with that. I get that. If a young person graduates from a school and has completed their degree and still has eligibility and can go and transfer, yes. Um, the negatives of it, if, if, if I can call them that, is what happens is sometimes young people with a scholarship or partial scholarship will go into the portal and then they end up with no place to land. So the data is starting to come through. Um, you know, I, I, I'm very approximate in this, but uh, you know, uh, probably 30% don't find a place to, to land and it's educating your student athletes that yes, you can transfer, but it's not always um, uh, the best thing. And you want young people uh, and all of us, right, to work through adversity and, and stick in there and do that. But you really do have to re-recruit your own roster um, now in college athletics. And so when you combine being able to instantly transfer and you combine name, image, and likeness, um, the difficulty we have is it's become unrestricted free agency and we're not even a professional franchise, right? We're higher, higher education that meets in the middle with entertainment. But um, anyways, um, it is new, right? It's scary. Um, but again, we're gonna work to navigate it and there's still students and still competing and I still believe in what the student athlete experience produces on the back end. You don't always have to be a star to benefit from that. Yeah. You know, and, and I understand I'm old. And, and so <laughs> I'm not this, so young either. This is, yeah. this is catching me in interesting ways. I mean, let's say someone did play four years from when graduate, they came and, and, and they can contribute to Virginia yes. Tech at, on one of the athlete, uh, uh, programs. I don't know that they can become a Hokie. Yeah. I mean, there's something, it was something neat about, I came to that program, I'm a freshman, you stay. Yeah. And that senior year, you get the yeah. championship and you wear that ring and, yeah. oh my goodness, I don't know. It's just, yeah. it just seems odd. Yeah, I do. I know I sound like I'm right down the middle, but I've had a lot of time to think on this. You know, I, um, that changed Major League Baseball too, right? When I was growing up and teams stayed the same and you really could get behind them and then free agency and, and things tend to evolve. And then, you know, I would use on our basketball team, just one example, um, Justin Mutz, right? He graduated from Delaware, transferred here, got to play on a bigger stage, has an undergraduate degree, two master's degree, um, and exemplifies that hokey spirit. But yes, you are correct. It's harder to know the players, feel like you do. Um, but yeah, there, there's a few ways to be a hokey and uh, we're working on that, yes, sir. <laughs> well, uh, well, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least want to get your, now all of a sudden the, the, the changes among the conferences. And I guess that has really big implications, whether it's the Big mm -hmm. Ten or what have you, and the ACC. What's your perspective in terms of what's going on in that arena? Yeah, it's, um, it really just comes down to um, money, resources, and um, access to championship. So in football or anytime you can, you want to have access that if your conference champion wins, you have access into this playoff system and everybody wants to play at the top tier. Nobody wants to admit their junior varsity or, or lesser. So it is a uh, keeping up with the Joneses. But what, what is causing all of this, I guess, to if, if people don't quite understand it, is television. Television has been one of the best things for college athletics and one of the most challenging. It has brought 
unbelievable popularity and visibility to the games. Remember when you could only see one game a weekend, maybe, and now it's done that. But it's flushed so much money into college athletics, um, um, and, and, and we've put it into facilities, we've put it into paying coaches, and now that model may be turning more to a, a pro model. You know, if you see the uh, Redskins are now commanders, um, uh, their practice, uh, indoor practice facility is a bubble. Their weight room is very simple, and they don't spend it on facilities, they, they spend it on the players. So um, we may be going that way. But anyways, back to the conference realignment and television packages, right? That's revenue that shows up no matter what, it comes automatically. Um, the ACC television package brings in around $40 million per school. And um, that's third out of the Power Five. The, the two that are ahead of us and, and everybody's paying attention to is the Southeastern Conference and the Big Ten. And they're probably in the 25 to 30 million more per year just on that one line item. Mm -hmm. And if you take that out over 10 years, you know, you're talking 350, 400 million dollars and it makes it tough to compete. So if we can close that gap in the ACC, even if you're, I know this is a lot of money, but even if you're a $10 million difference, right? You can spend your money more wisely, don't have as much debt service, you can compete. But that's the disturbing thing is that um, two, two are running away and the rest of us uh, certainly feel like we can compete and keep up but trying to close that gap. So it really comes down to money and uh, access to championships just to be candid. Wow. Um, the expansion of the college football playoff to 12 teams, your thoughts on that, is that? Yeah, I, I, I like it, right? Um, from a Virginia Tech standpoint, um, there would have been a, a lot more times we would have had an opportunity if there were 12 spots rather than two or, or four. So I like that. I do think we have to look at the number of games we're playing, right? We have all this data now and protections for, for head injuries, concussions, so much more data there. Um, so as we get into a playoff system, you know, how many games is that? entailed, you drop your conference championship games, um, how does it all work? But in general, I'm for it, and I'm very confident that will be coming our, our way around 2025, 20, 2026, and um, as long as the ACC has a direct uh, qualifying path, uh, we can get one in there, hopefully two or three some years, and obviously I'm hoping it's Virginia Tech. Yeah. <laughs> obviously. obviously. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the things when I was going off the athletics committee, and I don't want to overstate it because, um, again, a lot of this is still in process. But they're really looking at incentives across the board, even to the point where perhaps some incentives could be tied to grades and performance. Yeah, yeah. You, um, I guess what all of this proves is if you, we as a, the NCAA are, are too slow to change and evolve, outside forces will come in and dictate it, and that's oftentimes more painful than changing on your own. So. Again, another thing that was challenged in court and is now permissible is you can um, pay up to $5,980 a year to student athletes for academic performance. And you can set that criteria wherever you want. Is it GPA? Is it rate to graduation? Schools do not have to do it. Um, in a highly competitive environment at the top level of Division One. most of us do at some level. But um, it is, again, changing the model of the revenue we generate um, now going more to the student athletes directly and indirectly. So um, it is tough. I, I, I grew up on the, uh, a little more pure model and it is a lot of change and takes some getting used to and admittedly will turn some fans off. But hopefully when we get to playing games, uh, they'll remember why they enjoy it. But um, uh, it is tough to educate people and this is a great opportunity uh, to do that with this audience. So thank you. Well, it's really transformative. I mean, that's why I was talking about the transformation of, of college um, uh, athletics. Yes. And, um, but one thing, and obviously my career is at Virginia Tech, so that's kind of my knowledge base. But boy, um, you already do a good job in terms of following grade point averages, mm -hmm. following the graduation rate. Yes. And there's already this competitive, this certainly yardstick is there. I get a sense that coaches evaluation, that's certainly uh, yeah. part of the evaluation yeah. there. Right, right. Yes, um, we do ultimately bring them to Virginia Tech to graduate. You know, I hope they would have the same incentive 
uh, without getting paid for grades. I don't pay my kids for grades. Um, <laughs> but it is a chance, especially if you are not on scholarship or not very much of one. So we have 22 sports at Virginia Tech. UVA has more than that. But either way, there's only five sports that either one of us can offer full scholarships in. Yeah. It's men's basketball, women's basketball, football, volleyball, and I believe women's tennis are the five that we have. So all of our other student athletes might be on 10% scholarship, 50% scholarship, which is still great. But as you know, the cost of higher education has gone way up. So if we can use the academic incentive in some way to offset some of the cost, um, I do believe our coaches can use it from a recruiting standpoint that, hey, if you come here and handle your business, we're able to provide uh, more to you and offset that cost of college a little bit. But um, yes, you have hit on all the dynamic changes and it is hard to follow. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, and it's amazing. Um, so we see casinos coming mm -hmm. and gambling. Um, and I guess the next, I guess if you can have legalized gambling on some sports, why not also college athletics? Are you, are you yeah, about that? yeah, actually, a, a, as you may know, um, in the state of Virginia, you, betting on games is legal. You just are not able to bet on state of Virginia schools. So somebody in Roanoke could bet on North Carolina. They could bet on Stanford. They could bet on anybody in that uh, way. And it is legal, and it's generating tons and tons of of money so the protection is there a little bit in the state of Virginia but it is another education piece with your student athletes um, that it is it is not permissible for them to engage in that and then you get you know the, uh, worried about you know outside influences trying to swing games things such as that so society's changed cultures changed um, we try to protect it but no I, I don't think it will be too long if not already, that you can literally bet from your seat in real time while attending college games. Wow. Um, so someone who says, well, college athletics, especially the revenue sports, the major uh, sports, has become simply a minor league for the mm -hmm. pros. Uh, how would you yeah. answer someone who would ask you that question? You know, I would say they're probably right when it comes to football, right? We are the pipeline to the NFL. There's no minor league system. Um, I would certainly make the argument that the NFL should help fund some of that, right? We're their talent development. Um, the, the rest, there are minor league options. You know, baseball, you can turn pro out of high school or three years after, after high school. Um, so I like how the other sports work. Football is the one that um, feels a little different, and um, the NFL doesn't do anything in that regard. Well, we have just three minutes or so remaining. So is there such a thing as a student athlete? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, the, um, they certainly have to be full-time students, as you know, uh, in a good way. Academic requirements have gone up. It proves if you set the bar higher, they'll achieve higher. They are legitimate um, students that graduate at rates a little bit higher than the general student population. So I'm sold on that, absolutely. And then if you saw their schedule, um, how booked it is, their time management on down the road, I think it enables them to be good employees later in, in, in life, right? Or, or as soon as they get out of college, they've learned how to be a part of a team. They've learned how to be on time. Um, they can be coached. They, they've dealt with diverse teams and backgrounds. So I still believe in what it produces, but you have to squint and look a little harder to find the good stuff than we used to. Yes, sir. <laughs> but yes, they are student athletes and I'm hanging my hat on that. Um, although it is certainly looking more and more like professional sports. So we only have a couple of minutes remaining. I like this question, it's a generic kind of question, but it does provide a sense of priorities. What two things keep you up at night? <laughs> well, okay, yeah. I know you have 20. Yeah. But what might be the no, one or two? That's a great two? question. Um, <laughs> I go to sleep pretty well, but if I wake up in the morning and my mind is, is clicking, you know, I guess other than my own family and, <laughs> and kids, right? Yeah. That, that'll do it. I have three teenagers or one that's 21. but. Um, uh. Uh, it will make you a little, a little jumpy, you know, just things coming from, from left field. You like to plan, you like to be 
ready. Uh, some days there is anxiety of, my goodness, what's coming next? And you have to kind of reroute your mindset um, that way. You know, the things that keep me awake, it, I'm indirectly um, in charge of looking out for 600 student athletes and somebody else's sons and daughters. And sometimes they make mistakes or God forbid get hurt and um, that keeps you awake. But um, I guess it's the unknown, right? But we're taught fear of the unknown is often worse than the reality. So yeah, I go to sleep pretty well, but if I wake up early, my mind's clicking and it's game on, so. I can imagine. I know that the uh, Hokie Nation very much appreciates all your efforts, and especially in this incredible transformative yeah. time. Thank you. Well, that is all the time we have. I want to thank my guest with Bob Cox, the Director of Athletics at Virginia Tech. And of course, I want to thank you for joining us in the conversation and hope you do so for the next conversation with Bob Denton.